It's no secret by now that there are a lot of great white sharks all along the Southern California coast. In much of my footage, you see an object attached to some great white sharks. Most of them are acoustic tags, and the data those tags provide can tell researchers much about the sharks, their environment, and their movements. All right, I am on the Scripps Laboratory Pier right now. We're about to go tag some sharks with the California State University Long Beach Shark Lab. The team is here prepping the boat, getting everything ready. I'm excited to learn more about the program and the research that they're doing here in Southern California. You can learn about arrays, learn about how they tag them. Hopefully see some sharks this morning. I could hardly wait to get out there and see the team in action. But first, I needed to know, what's an array? So uh, an array, so we use acoustic telemetry, which just uses essentially sound to track the animals. So acoustic sound, sound travels really well in the water. And so our array is um, a, a, basically a clump of these receivers. So generally, if you just have one of these receivers in the water, it just gives you presence absence. Is the shark somewhere within a radius of this receiver, yes or no? But if we put several of these really close together in the water, if the shark is swimming through the area, if three or more of these detect the shark, we can triangulate an exact position of that animal in the water. And because a lot of our sharks have pressure sensors, we not only know where in the horizontally they are in the water, we have a vertical position. So we have a 3D location of how the sharks are using the space within the array. All right, tell me what's up with these bags. <laughs> So these are sandbags that we use to moor our receivers. Um, so basically they just add a, act like giant paperweights so that we always know where our receivers are, so we always know where the sharks are. And that's how we track them over long periods of time. So everything was ready. It was time to go. But the boat, it was still on the pier. It had to be lowered into the water. I was not expecting that. And I had to climb down a ladder. Let's just say, I didn't do it very fast, but I made my way down and we were off. We're within like 20 feet, so this is good. Um, so right now we're going to drop in a few more acoustic receivers to just kind of plug in some holes to make sure that we're getting all of our sharks detected. Are you going to get in the water for that? So not today. No. We're getting it in the water. So essentially to download the data, we have to get in the water. So we're going to drop in all of our receivers. And every about month or so, we'll actually scuba dive in these aggregation sites to grab the receivers, pull them up onto the boat, download all the data, and then we'll go and redeploy them. So we're in the water with the sharks all the time. <laughs> I always see their fins from the surface before we get in. And then the moment I get in the water, they never want to come close to me for some reason. <laughs> now I've seen many tags on sharks from the air but I've never really seen one up close. They are much smaller than I imagined. It will be attached in the pole spear, and then we'll sneak up on the shark and just dart it into its back while it's swimming. And because sharks are made of cartilage, it's just like piercing an ear for them. So imagine this is just, when you pierce your ear, you have a needle that goes through it, and then it just dangles, and it doesn't bug us. Like, I've got several earrings in that I don't really think about, and so this is just the earring for the shark, essentially. So Patrick just <laughs> wants a drone. He's the shark McDonald's. spotter in there underneath his little hood there, uh, and uh, he's searching for juvenile great white sharks. Let's see how long it takes to find one. Uh, ironic. That didn't take long. He found two already, and uh, we'll listen to his play-by-play. -play. The first thing Patrick does is confirm whether the shark is tagged already. All right, there's one directly in shore of us. That's right at the surface. This one is untagged. I don't know if you can see the drone, but the drone is marking where the shark is at the moment. Now remember, this tagging doesn't involve fishing or doesn't involve pulling the shark out of the water. So we have to uh, rely on uh, visual and drone spotting. Uh, no chum as well, so it's one of the benefits of, of tagging sharks this way. All right, slow up, Jack. Oh, she spooked. That's okay. Okay, stay on it then. It turns out photographing a shark's underbelly to determine the sex is a bit harder than I thought. 
I did not get that. <laughs> oh, wow. Look at that dorsal fin. They just like so skittish today. It's incredible how shallow they get. Wow, how close to the beach. This like... is bananas. We tried a few times, but couldn't get the shot we needed to start. So Emily decided to regather and try again in a few minutes. So I took this time to ask her a few questions about her research. All right, so what are we doing right now? Yeah, What's we're trying on? to let the, the sharks get a break. A lot of them are really skittish right now, so we're basically just going to try to let them calm back down, go back inshore where it's shallower so they can't just dive and, and avoid us because we really need them in like the top three feet of the water to tag them. One shark that I filmed yeah. last year, I know within a week and a half's time I saw it between 50 and 70 miles between two locations. Oh, yeah. There's a, I've had a shark, so one of my studies was basically figuring out what influences the sharks to leave the aggregation site. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the year, if they don't have to leave, they wouldn't, so what causes them to leave? And that's something that I was answering. And when the temperature got too cold, essentially, they were looking for warmer water. And they went down from Santa Barbara to Ventura and back, which is over 35 miles in a single day. Wow. And so they can book it if properly motivated. They can move quickly when they want to. So it's safe to say that on any particular beach in Southern California, you're probably near shark because they're either going from a nursery to a nursery and using those highways to go back and forth, right? Oh yeah, and that's what we see in our receivers. Well, we'll have our receivers kind of down the coast and we'll just see the direct line of movement straight down the coast and then they'll hang out and like, yeah, it's literally like the highways, like you said, with like movements and then highways between them. And with, with all that data that you're getting and say you tag, what, what was it, 130 or so last mm -hmm. year? Do we have any estimates of what the population could actually be? So that's something that we're reevaluating. So I know a few years ago there was a population estimate that came out, but we think it was an underestimation. So we're trying to reevaluate what the population is, especially for the juveniles. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of something that we're currently doing in the middle of, of figuring out how many juveniles we have and then therefore how many adults we might have because of that. So it was time to try again. Emily was determined to get a tag out today. This time, she got the shot she needed. I'm gonna keep this in for a oh, There it is, right there. Right there, oh, you're gonna get it. Oh, that's definitely a shot. She got the camera right underneath there. See if there's claspers or not. I'm gonna determine the sex and let's see. Uh... With the sex determined, it was time for me to put the drone up and assist in spotting. Patrick and Emily both got to work on deploying a tag and I got to see firsthand a behavior I've filmed time and time again. Watching a great white shark come up behind you firsthand was pretty amazing. This instinctive behavior is something I see daily, but I rarely am this close. It was time to tag a shark, but just like photographing it, placing the tag is much easier said slow up, slow than up. done. Oh, what the heck? No, it bounced it off of it. Right here. This right is, here. okay, let me get this unstuck real fast. This one got away. What the heck? It didn't take long to find another shark, however. This time, Emily and Patrick decided to try a different approach. They would photograph and tag the shark at the same time an approach that in the past has been more successful around sharks that are more skittish. Still, this method required us to get closer. As with anything in nature, patience is vital. But finally, the team accomplished the morning's mission. With Patrick and Emily both focused on the shark, they were able to finally deploy a tag. And when they did, there was no time for celebration. It was all about data collection. Oh yeah, I got that too. All right, let's get the time. Okay, let me see the sex. Oh yeah, I got it, okay, yeah. All right, let's, uh, we got, uh, where's the data sheet? Okay, so let's get the time and the GPS. Joining a group of young scientists like Emily and Patrick on a tagging mission was an extraordinary learning experience. 
both Patrick and Emily have conducted and have completed some important studies regarding these white sharks. I have links to their published work in the video description. I highly encourage you to read them, both of which could not be done without the data gathered from this team's work and the tags on those sharks. As we ended the day, I left with some new knowledge of the Shark Lab's research and a greater understanding of the work it takes to conduct such studies, all of which are vital to understanding not just the importance of the white shark in the ecosystem, but our role as guests in their home. All that was left to do was climb that ladder, a ladder that Emily climbed much faster than I did. It's safe to say it was a great day to research sharks.